Please be seated. Well, good morning and welcome. I bring you greetings from Canada. It's a big place, Canada, you know. There's lots of room for anyone who might want to come there. <laughs> Just saying. It's great to be with you on this Memorial Day weekend, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, Paul is in California. My husband, Paul, is in California. He actually just received the, uh, the uh, what did he receive? Chuck Colson Award uh, for Courage from um, Biola this uh, weekend. And he also gave the commencement speech to 10,000 people, would you believe, there? Um, I can't imagine how that feels, because I get nervous enough when I come and speak mm -hmm. to you guys. But we'll pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us this morning. So let's do that. Let's pray. Holy One, we thank you for your spirit here present with us. We pray that uh, thy word only be spoken and thy word only be heard. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Fleming Rutledge is an Episcopal priest, and she tells of uh, one time when she was reading a Bible story to her grandchild, and it was one particularly amazing Bible story. I forget which one now. Maybe it was the one from Kings that Linda read so well for us this morning. But when she finished the story, the child looked at her and said, Is it true? Is it true? It's a good question, isn't it? I wonder what you would say to that having heard that story of Elijah, is it true? Let's look a little bit at the story, but first we need to flip back to chapter 16 just to set the stage for what was going on. In the year, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel for 22 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He married Jezebel, who supported the lots of of the false gods collectively under Baal. And Ahab himself took to worshiping Baal and even erected an altar. Ahab, we are told, did more to provoke God's anger than all the kings that had gone before him. And then along comes Elijah, marches up to the king and announces, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain except by my word. And this is quickly followed by the word of the Lord telling Elijah to make a quick retreat. But it's also a reminder to us that the word that Elijah is hearing is God's word. Then we fast forward three years, skipping the bit about the widow and son, which you will hear read next week, which emphasizes just how bad things were. Three years of drought have caused real hardship. And then the word of the Lord comes again to Elijah. Go show yourself to the king Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And so Elijah does just that. When Ahab sees him, he says, he calls him the troubler of Israel. He blames Elijah for the troubles that, that Israel is going through. It's so much easier, isn't it, to blame someone else? It's so much easier than looking in the mirror and thinking, I wonder if I may have had anything to do with it. Elijah comes back straight away. He doesn't mince words. You are the troubler of Israel because you abandoned the Lord's commandments and followed the Baals. It is you who are the true troubler. And maybe while Ahab is just catching a breath there, Elijah tells him, gather all Israel and all those prophets of Baal who eat at Jezebel's table and meet me at Mount Carmel. And surprisingly, Ahab agrees. <clears throat> Maybe he thinks that Baal and all the prophets of Baal will come through. He's in for a surprise. And this brings us to the passage that we heard read this morning. The people gather and Elijah challenges them. How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And then Elijah tells them that though he is but one prophet of the Lord, he isn't indeed one, just one prophet, but he's maybe the one who's standing up and the others are not. And his 450 prophets of Baal, there is to be a challenge. Two bulls are chosen, and the Baal prophets can choose whichever bull they want to use as a sacrifice, and they go first. They're to lay it on wood, but no fire is to be lit. 
And then Elijah will do the same thing. And then they will call on their, and then the Baals will call, the Baal prophets will call on Baal. And Elijah will call on God. And the God who answers is indeed God. To which the people who had said nothing up to then said, well spoken. Or as what came to mind as I was writing the sermon, jolly good show. <laughs> and what do, kind of show did they expect, I wonder? Who did they think would win? Did they see it as a contest between equals? Were they so blind, limping along so badly with lukewarm faith at best, wavering with different doctrines or no doctrine at all, sitting on the fence? Sitting on the fence, after all, doesn't demand very much, does it? But do you remember the priest Eli? He was sitting on a fence once and he fell backwards and broke his neck. It's not a terribly safe place to sit. But it seems the people needed to see something really spectacular in order for their faith to be reignited. Well, they got it. First, the prophets of Baal put on a real show, calling on Baal all morning, but no show. And around noon, Elijah has had enough, so he begins to taunt them. Maybe a god's having a snooze, or gone for a walk. Perhaps he's having a bowel movement. Now, it doesn't actually say that in our rather neat NRSV, but the Hebrew word is he wandered away to a private place, which would kind of fit in with the way that Elijah is speaking right now. Whatever Baal is doing, he is not responding, even when his prophets get really frantic in their attempts to get his attention. And then in agreed time, they stop. Baal is a no-show. Then it's time for Elijah who calls on God after dousing the wood until it's soaking. Again and again and again, he splashes the, the water, kind of like the Bishop of Liverpool at the baptism. There's no way that this wood is going to light. And then he prays, Answer me, your servant, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. See, it's not for Elijah's glory but that's the people that might know God. It is for God's glory. And when the fire falls, the people are left in no doubt, falling to their knees, they say, the Lord indeed is God, the Lord indeed is God. It's rep repeated so that it's writ large, bold type. So is it true? Or is it just too fantastic, too supernatural to believe? Was Elijah a real person? Were any of the characters real people? What about Abraham, or Isaac, or Ruth, or David, or Jesus? Were they just figments of someone's imagination? Made a good story? And if supernatural is a problem for us, we'll have to throw out most of scripture and the gospels are gone for sure, because how could Christ have been resurrected from the dead? St. Paul, writing to the churches of Galatia, leaves them and us in no doubt as to where the truth can be found. I am astonished, he says, although my guess is he said something a little more st strong than that. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel. But there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So there's always going to be false teachers around. And Jesus himself had some pretty strong words for those who would lead others astray. Better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and be thrown into the sea. Now millstones are big. They're really big. And the sea is deep. So I think we get the picture, don't we? But let's be clear, the source of passion of Elijah, of Paul, of Jesus, is the love of God. And knowing that love, becoming a follower of Jesus, de demands from us our all. There's no room for counterfeit gods. There's no room for a little bit of syncretism. There's no room for a little bit of new age here and a little bit of Zen here and I'll mix it all up until it's my personal faith. You'll note that Elijah and Paul and Jesus are not speaking 
uh, to individuals, but to a community. The Christian faith is for a community. It is as a community that we gather this morning, that we gather in the US and in Canada and throughout the world, that we are reminded as we gather of God's love and that we hear again some of the characters that he worked through to show that love, which certainly causes me to reflect, and maybe you too, if they can use someone like that, maybe they can even use me. No matter how far we've strayed, even with our weak and sometimes shaky faith. We are in the season of Pentecost. And we're reminded how the Holy Spirit came down in tongues of fire. And that image, the church fathers use that image when they, see the, when they look at the story of Elijah with the flames coming down. And so we are, it's a foretaste of what was to come. And those disciples who were scared sitting there in their room suddenly are filled with the Spirit of God and sent out to preach the word. Spirit of God dwells within us when we invite him. He dwells within us. He gives us the words to speak. When we accept that love, when we repent and turn, even though it may seem foolish to others, even to ourselves sometimes, because there are days, aren't there? There are days when we wonder, is it true? Is it true? And if it is, what does that mean for my life? And you know, being a follower of Jesus does not mean that we have to shun others who have different beliefs. But neither should we be tempted to water down our faith. Because one size doesn't fit all. But in accepting God's love, we in turn can love leaning into God's arms, loving out of our faith, though usually in a less dramatic way than some of the prophets. But you know, even Elijah had his days. Remember, he'd witnessed this amazing miracle of the fire. And prior to that, as we'll hear next week, he had prayed for a child who died and the child had come back to life. After the fire came down, the rain began to fall, and, and uh, Elijah runs all the way to the palace where Jezebel is, but maybe dancing in the rain. But then something happens. He loses his bottle, as they say in Britain. He gets scared, and he heads up to the hills. He's done with the big stuff. He just wants to hear the still, small voice, the whisper of God. And I wonder if you want to hear that whisper of God again today. Because sometimes we're so busy we miss it. But it's always there. It's always there. I will be with you to the end. I will never leave you. When I prepare my sermon, I pray over the verses and I say, Lord, what do you want the people of St. James to hear? And the word that came so clear was love was love, that you are loved. You are loved more than you could possibly imagine. And it is that love that calls us from sitting on that fence to following Jesus. So ask yourself again, is it true? Is the word spoken and recorded and living the true word of God. Because that decision will dis affect all that you do, how you live your life. And the path is not smooth. You know, I think sometimes Christians think that when they give their lives to God, that that's it. They're not going to hurt. They're not going to feel pain. They're not going to suffer. They're not going to lose their jobs. They're not going to lose their loved one. Their marriage is not going to fall apart. Oh, how I wish, but it ain't so. But our Lord is walking the path with us. And we are called to stay the course, no matter how bad it gets. Most of, most of us won't have that mountaintop experience. But we might just catch that whisper. We stay.
stay the course and God's love will not change. Through our fears and our doubts and our sins and our sorrows and our joy so that we may come together and pray. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs>